Hey everybody, in this video I'm going to be talking about a Facebook post I did, um, the Spirit of Truth and Spiritual Mentors, and I'm going to uh, kind of just go over what I was thinking as I wrote this. Here's the text. One of the ways God gets our attention is when the Spirit of Truth illuminates a passage as we read the Bible, John 16, 13. We may have gone over the Bible several times, and still some doctrines in Scripture can remain hidden because of our theological lenses or preconceived ideas. We develop these theological lenses or pre preconceived notions when we listen to preachers or get caught up with media much more than we read or listen to the Bible. Our fountain of learning is not from the source, but is somewhat like third-hand knowledge or stale manna. Doing this actually conditions us to ignore or become callous to the Spirit, 2 Corinthians 4, 2-6. The current monologue system does not allow for questions and answers like Jesus had with his disciples. Learning in the monologue system is not nearly as effective as with a mentor or a group setting like Jesus and the earlier early disciples. 1 Corinthians 14 and Acts 13 are good passages to ponder about group gatherings, as well as the sessions when Jesus taught and did on-the-job discipling. When we read a scripture and the Spirit of Truth illuminates it to us, other passages will pop up in the Spirit confirming, attenuating, or contrasting the current passage. It's at that point that we wait on God and dig into the Word looking for other passages to illuminate the doctrine even more. Once you catch on to this, you will find that passages pop up that you've previously glazed over or even flat out ignored them. You'll begin to see it all throughout Scripture, even for years to come. I've run across doctrines that have come up over the years that were not popular doctrines, but were a hidden treasure, right? Matthew 13, 44. I then toss it over with mentors that have the signs of a believer, Mark 16, at, at, at operation in their lives and, and find that they are pretty much on the same page. Now, we want to strive to be the few that find it, Matthew 7, 13 through 14, that Jesus talks about. So if a doctrine is popular and the Spirit of Truth is highlighting something contrary or attenuates it, it is time to talk it over with a spiritual mentor, not just any mentor, but one with the fruit of the Spirit in Galatians, uh, signs of a believer that Jesus guarantees in Scripture. So if we're a lone cowboy with spiritual mentors, we have a possibility of falling into error like many have. Many people have gotten a real revelation from God, then got puffed up or off by themselves, and then went off track. So we need to be cautious of this pitfall. It's very serious. Now, you guys know my passion is for you to have a spiritual relationship with the biblical Jesus. Let's dig into this. The spirit of truth in mentors. One of the ways God gets our attention is when the spirit of truth illuminates a passage as we read the Bible. This is my post. I'm reading it. <clears throat> so have you been reading the Bible and... All the, you know, it's kind of like you're just reading, and then all of a sudden something lights up, and it's like the angels sing, and you get all excited. God, the Spirit of Truth, will guide us into all truth. He will even show us things to come. Jesus guarantees that, and we should get excited to be discipled. If my words continue in you, you're my disciples indeed. Jesus says that, man. And we may have gone over the Bible several times, and still some doctrines in Scripture can remain hidden because of our theological lenses, right, and our preconceived ideas. And we get these theological lenses and these preconceived ideas, we develop them when we listen primarily to things other than the Bible. And, you know, I understand, I want to, when I first got saved, God said, open your eyes, you know, and read the instructions. So I read the Bible, but something told me, oh, you need to learn from the PhDs. Oh, you're not smart enough. You need to learn from da 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 So I kind of got off a little bit. I started reading PhDs, commentaries, the Left Behind series. I mean, I was just devouring everything I could. And I realized that as I did this, I was schlacking myself some theological lens on when I did my actual Bible reading, that I was actually blocking the spirit of truth. And let me give you an example so you know what I'm talking about. Let's say that the first time Jesus came, 
you know, they had their theological lens. They just threw out Isaiah 53, the suffering servant passage. It didn't fit their paradigm, right? So they, anytime, anytime Jesus is supposed to go to the cross or he's supposed to die or whatever, this doesn't compute. They had a theological lens on, right? So, um, it's, it's been there the whole time. The passage, it said he's going to suffer. And Daniel chapter 9 says Messiah is going to be cut off, but not for himself, right? So you got this theological lens because you paid attention to people that weren't anointed, that weren't led by the, the Holy Spirit. I mean, they weren't. I mean, the, the people that wrote the Bible were, but a lot of the top teachers were ignoring what the Spirit was saying. So one of the times my grandmother, Mamma, she raised me. She says, Conrad. Did you know angels had sex with women? I'm like, what? And guess what? I had read the Bible several times, several times. And I was, it didn't fit my theology. And she goes, it's right there, Genesis chapter 6. And I'm like, oh, oh, yeah. And then the flood. And then, oh. So at that moment, I realized that I needed to stop paying attention to my theological lens so much as what? the Bible says, and what the Spirit of Truth says, you know? Now, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go on some more, because you can get off an error with this if you just stop there. Um, so we listen to preachers, you know, the itching ears ones mainly, and we get caught up in what we read or listen to. Our fountain of learning is not from the source. You know, it's not from our own cistern. It's not it's not from the source of God. It's stale manna. It's second or third person. And we're just kind of, you know, we're, we're, we're slacking on this lens. And this actually, doing this actually blocks the spirit of truth. I think I went over that with, with you earlier. Now, the current monologue system, what it is morphed into today is not what it was originally intended. If you remember, they break bread from house to house. Uh, they did it daily in Acts chapter 2. I think it's the second to last verse. Corinthian talks about how they, they met daily, um, and they fellowshiped. And the monologue system that we have today is not how they taught back then. Okay, and a couple of good passages, how to have church. Acts 13, I love that part where they minister and fast and wait on the Lord, and then the Holy Ghost says something, gives you some orders. That's Acts 13. 1 Corinthians 14, all of you guys have psalms and hymns, da, 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 talks about speaking in tongues, talks about prophesying over each other. That's a church service, right? What we have today, you can't go, hey, I disagree with that, or can you elaborate? No, the monologue system is not designed to disciple. It's just, you know, come, come on, let's face it, it's just not going to work. So now, um, when we read the Scripture, okay, and the Spirit of Truth illuminates something to us, Here's what happens with me, and I believe this is how one of the ways that the Spirit of Truth guides us in all truth. Since I have familiarity with the Bible, you know, I've hidden your word in my heart so I don't sin against you. You know, meditate in his precepts. You got to get the word, you got to abide in the vine. Jesus is the word. I mean, there's so many scriptures that say the 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 words of God should flow in and out of you. We shouldn't even think our own thoughts. We should be conformed not to the world, but to the, to the word of God. And when we read the Spirit of Truth, and God's showing you something, okay, it'll go ding, 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 ding. I mean, you, you'll know what I'm talking about, okay? Um, all of a sudden, with me, other scriptures pop up. There's like this tapestry of doctrine, and it's so fast that there's no words spoken. It's just, you know, it's just, you know. And then what happens, um, let's see if I wrote it here. It's at that point where we wait on God. Now, we wait on God when I say Wait on God. I don't mean, you know, necessarily just stop doing and stop, you know, whistle until something else happens. It, these doctrines might take years to develop. Months, weeks, it may be quicker than that. Sometimes you get this download and just like, wow. Um, and that's one of the things that used to happen to me when I had the studio in Spring, Texas. I would worship in the studio. It was a worship studio. And I was, the Spirit of God would show up so much that I would go to sleep on my futon I had in there, and I would wake up, and it's like the early, you know, how in the book of Job, chapter 33, I think, talks about he seals your ear with instruction. Man, he was like downloading this doctrine to me, and I'm like, wow, this is pretty cool. It's awesome. I just knew it, and all these scriptures fit together. So when we get that spirit of truth to give us illuminated doctrine, a, a passage to us, 
other scriptures seem to pop up. They either contrast, confirm, or attenuate something. Okay? Uh, they might buck, they usually buck the, the popular doctrine. I hate, you know, unfortunately, the popular doctrines are usually wrong. Um, so we wait. And once, once you get what I'm saying here, once you get that um, the Spirit of Truth will start showing you something that you've never seen before, all of a sudden, and it happens with me a lot, all of a sudden it starts showing up all throughout the Bible. I go through the Bible, Genesis through Revelation. I've gone through it about six times this year. I just finished my sixth time today. But when you go through it, uh, you start paying attention. Other scriptures just kind of go, wow, here I am. This confirms the doctrine I've been teaching you. So that's pretty cool. Now, I'm going to go even further because if we stop there, we can get into error. Um, next, I'm going to say I've run across doctrines that have come up over the years that were not popular doctrines but were a hidden treasure. And then I toss it over with mentors. Now, I'm going to talk about mentors. Um, mentors, now I want you to understand my position, my take on it, okay? I toss it over with mentors that have the signs of a believer. Now, a lot of people... They, they kind of uh, take issue with me saying, hey, i got to have the signs of a believer. But we shall know people by their fruit. Okay, in Mark 16, that passage says, he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. And these signs shall follow them that believe. In my name they shall cast out devils. They shall speak with new tongues. They'll take up serpents. If they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. They shall lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. Now that shouldn't, that shouldn't blow your mind. <laughs> I mean, you know, um, Casting out devils. Sickness is a devil. Ask Kevin Reardon. Ask Gary Nesbitt. Ask Doug Hansen. Ask, you know, the people that are doing this. Cast out a devil. Uh, speak in new tongues. I believe that Jesus says we'll speak in new tongues. And I know Corinthians takes issue with that. He, Jesus might not say, and uh, I don't think, I think Paul says in Corinthians, do all speak in tongues. Okay. And these, these signs shall follow them that believe. I mean, you're probably going to hang out with somebody that speaks with tongues. They shall take up serpents. Now, I'm not talking about snake-handling preachers, okay? But think about Paul. When he got bit on his hand, the viper came out in Malta, and it didn't hurt him, right? He, had a, he shook it off, okay? Uh, they shall drink deadly thing. If they drink anything deadly, it shall not hurt them. I think Yangi Cho's son, uh, he drank poison. Along with everybody in his class, I believe somebody poisoned a class or something, and that kid was raised from the dead. <laughs> Lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. This should not blow your mind. So I believe a mentor should have signs of a believer and also the fruit of the spirit. Uh, we, like I said, we shall know them by their fruit. Okay. So, and I'm gonna tell you something else about the mentors. Uh, this is one of the reasons I want to attenuate a little bit of my my Facebook post. God brings me mentors. Over the years, I mean, I'm telling you, I can name, I could name them off, <laughs> okay? Uh, when I first had my encounter with Jesus, God set me up with somebody, and right away, he was an attorney, had no idea I was about to, about to be mentored. And then somebody else, and then somebody else, and then somebody else, and I keep learning things as I go. God, if you seek, if you pray to God in your closet, He's going to reward you openly. He is a rewarder of those that diligently seek Him. So mentors show up. And they all had the signs of a believer. Amen? They also had the fruit of the Spirit. Um, now, yeah, think of it this way, too. Why would you want to be discipled by someone that doesn't have the fruit of the Spirit, doesn't have the signs of a believer? Right? Okay. Now, we want to strive to be the few that find it. You know, Jesus says something in Matthew 7, 13 here that, that you know, people ignore, <laughs> but it's there. Enter ye in at the straight gate. S-T-R-A-I-T -T does not mean straight. It means surrounded with obstacles. If you want to look at the Strong's definition behind that word, it is stenos. Uh, it means narrow from obstacles standing close about. That's why Jesus says strive in a little bit. For wide is the gate and broad is the way that leads to destruction. So if it's a wide path, hmm. You might want to think about that. And he says, and many there be which go in there at, because straight is the gate, S-T-R-A-I-T, and narrow is the way which leadeth in the light, life, and few there be that find it. So we want to be the few that find it. Amen? 
Um, now I'm going to continue on here because this thinking is awesome. This, what I'm talking about is awesome, but you can become a lone cowboy and you can get off into error. One of the things that I see people say is, oh, I don't need, I don't need the Bible. I got the Holy Spirit. And they're, they're referring to that passage in the little Johns that talks about, you need that no one teach you. You have an unction. Well, in that passage, and I've talked about this several times in my podcast, um, John is teaching them that they no longer need a teacher. He, is, he identifies that they are to a point to where they um, no longer need a teacher. So he talks about the young men, the babies, the men you've overcome. And he says, now you, now you got it. He was teaching them that they no longer needed the teacher. So don't, when, you, when you start getting these... Uh, revelations from God. The spirit of truth will guide you in all truth. You get real excited. And I suggest strongly uh, pray about it. And you don't want to have a pearls before swine type mentality because a lot of things, you know, Jesus expounded to his disciples that were close to him. And the masses, he spoke in parables. Why did he speak in parables to the masses? For, for those with ears that hear, they're going to think about it. They're going to chew on it. They're going to eat the flesh and drink the blood of the Son of Man. They're going to chew on that and get closer to him, right? That's why he spoke in parables. He's basically weeding them out. If you read John chapter 6, he really said some hard stuff, and he weeded them out. John 6, 6, 6 says, and many of his disciples walk with him no more, So because he was saying hard stuff. So he's weeding them out. Do, using that dragnet, you know, that kingdom of heaven is like a dragnet mentality, says the wide thing. And he throws all the bad fishes out, and he keeps the good fish. That's the Peter, James, and John, the 12 disciples, stuff like that. So when we get this revelation from God, toss it over with your spiritual mentors, those with signs of a believer, those with the fruit of the Spirit. Amen? And that's a pretty awesome conversation. <laughs> that's a pretty awesome thing to do. But if you do not, now there are some several there are several figures in history um, that made mistakes. They had genuine, true revelation in the beginning, and then it went to their head. You know, Paul says knowledge puffs puffs up. Um, the knowledge went to their head. Like for instance, Alexander Dowie, John Alexander Dowie, I think that's his name. Back in the 1800s, huge ministry, wheelchairs up on the wall. I mean, he he founded the city of Zion in Illinois. But you don't hear about him because he's went off, he went off the reservation in the last part. He was so elevated at the end of his ministry um, that, that he went off the reservation. There's the guy from the Welsh Revival, huge revival. Look at the end of his life. There's, yeah, I don't want to keep naming names. But my point is you, just, you, want to, um, you want to toss it over with mentors and not have so much pride and not think that you're so awesome that you don't need any give and take. Iron sharpens iron. Toss it over with the mentors. Let them give you a contrasting opinion, okay? So I just wanted to share that with you. Um, Lexi Rogers says, this is why we call it the living word. I'm always amazed when I read the same scripture many times and a new lesson comes up. Amen. It's like that rock of revelation hitting the water of the word, bam, there's that giant first ripple, but then there's other waves of revelation that keep coming. Uh, Carissa Carrasco says something really nice. She says, Conrad, you've been given a true gift to teach, and when you teach, you're not pushing your own theology on others, but just trying to give God's truth and sort it out, make people think for themselves. That's what I do. I try to get you to, that's why I ask the questions that rock, you know, what are we doing? Are we following the spirit of truth? Are we finding are we following the Word of God? And I'll tell you, a lot of people get all nervous when I say follow the Spirit. I'm not saying don't follow the Bible. I'm not. Jesus is the Word. The Word and the Spirit agree. Amen. There are three that bear witness in heaven: the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. And let's see, what's that passage? And these three agree in one. It's um. 1 John 5, 7. They agree is my point. And I want to make sure you get this point as well. For there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. That's one, one of the major uh, doctrines of the Trinity. 
Okay. So the spirit will never violate the word. Okay. So he will never jump the fence. He will never go, whoops, like go marry that person when you're already married. Come on. The Bible says don't do that. That's why we need to know <coughs> the spirit for ourselves. Amen. If this has taught you, please hit the like button and subscribe and share this with your friends and family. Also, I have a question for you. Do you have a spiritual mentor? How did that come about? How has this benefited you? Can you see the value in spiritual mentors? God bless you. Thank you for being in my life. Till we meet again, dig deeper and go higher.